morning. Welcome to Grace Community Church this morning. Uh, as we're going into Memorial Day weekend, how many here are, are happy that we have our freedom this morning? Yes. And that freedom came with a cost. And we know that, that some even gave their lives for that. So we want to honor them this morning. Um, I've asked Abigail Hedgecoth to come this morning. She is um, going into the eighth grade next year. She's been in the band for one year, and she is going to play taps for us this morning. So if you all stand, let's take this moment to, to honor our fallen soldiers. Thank you. You may be seated. Thank you very much. Didn't the worship team do an awesome job? They were on fire. <laughs> that wasn't supposed to do that, but it did it for some reason or another. So that was like timing. That was perfect timing there. Uh, I'm just so proud of our young people. They've been uh, playing upstairs some and uh so we've been kind of challenging them to come down and and uh, and actually start doing something on a regular basis in our our congregation and uh, they are so ready for that they are good and it just makes me feel good to see the next generation coming on very powerfully and uh, uh i just i thank the lord for them also, today in the second service, I wasn't here last week. I went to see my, my granddaughter and my two grandsons be uh, dedicated to the Lord. And uh, it's very special to be there and get back this Sunday. And in second service, we have not one, not two, not three, not four, not five, seven babies being dedicated in the second service. So... As some of you older ones, like me and Sharon and Anthony and John, as we get older, there's a whole new crop coming in to replace us. <laughs> Worship team, there's a whole new crop coming in to replace you, which I know you're pleased to know that the young people are in there and they're coming along. Uh, last, last week, uh, the first part of the week, my wife had birthday like for four or five days and Monday I had birthday <laughs> turned 60 last week and it really got to me uh, so we're starting a new series and this new series is called campfire stories one of my favorite things to do especially in the summer is to hang out go fishing go camping how many likes to do that sit around a fire <laughs> or just you know don't, sometimes it's too hot to have a fire, but just sit around. Towards night, you light a fire to keep the bugs away and all that, but you sit around. And what happens a lot of times, you know, that you're not around the TV and hopefully the iPad and all that stuff. And so families tell stories. And there's something about sitting around those kind of settings, sitting around a fire, telling stories that got us thinking that's kind of what we want this summer to feel like most of you've been through enough stress this year the school year the school kids are out uh, a lot of the teachers and principals and all you're out for a little bit of a time anyway and we want this to be kind of a no stress summer so as you come on sunday morning we want you I, I'm, I'm dressed up more than I will be this summer i'll be wearing my jeans again some uh, I may wear some cutoffs one day i don't know might get my legs good and tan. I don't know. We might have some lawn chairs up here, and we just, people talk around the fire. You know, we may do that. Uh, we may not be able to talk about some of the stuff y'all talk around the fire. <laughs> uh, but we do want it to be a casual summer. But also, we want it to be a productive summer. And uh, we come up with this theme in our staff meeting, Your Story, His Glory. We've all got a story, and our story 
is about his glory. I don't know about you, but if, if I was writing a book as the author, I get to tell the story how I want to tell the story, right? Well, the Bible, the early church got it. The early church, Jesus came. A lot of people didn't believe in Jesus when he came. The Pharisees didn't believe in Jesus when he came. They looked for every possible reason to deny him of the fact that he was the Messiah, that he was God. On every occasion, they tried to deny the fact that he was God. But what eventually happened, people began to tell their stories. Matthew told his story. Mark, Luke, John told his story. Uh, the early church started telling their story. There's over 500 people told their stories about him being raised from the dead. And it come to find out that these stories began to be very powerful because the stories, they actually brought uh, power to the Scripture. You think, well, the Scripture brings power. The Scripture is very important. I mean, loves your Bible. The Bible is very important. But you know, what is the Bible full of? It's full of a little bit of doctrine, but most of it's stories. It's stories about people that followed this book their life was changed. Maybe they were healed. Maybe they were delivered. Maybe they were delivered from being demon-possessed. Maybe uh, this, uh, they were, had a horrible life before Jesus Christ, but they tell their stories. And so the, the, the book is uh, 40 different authors telling a story, and all the stories go together. I love to hear people telling a story about what their grandparents did or something they did on a camp. And it's usually crazy. It's like, hey, Bubba, come here and watch this. <laughs> uh, believe it or not, we were gathered over at Teresa's house. Teresa and Roger invited us over yesterday. And, you know, as the day goes on and the sun starts going down, crazy stuff starts happening. <laughs> and uh, Sherry had this uh, little, looked like a tennis racket that was a, uh, you could, touch a bug with it and it'd zap them so we got a wondering what would happen or I got a wondering what would happen if you touch your tongue to that zap and uh well it about knocked me out of the lawn chair well it did knock me out of the lawn chair I'll just admit it it knocked me out of the lawn chair my lawn chair fell over but uh I can personally tell you what happens when you stick your tongue to a bug zapper you will have a very special story in the morning. <laughs> and I was wondering if my tongue was going to come back or I was going to talk well, really funny today. <laughs> I, want to, I want to get on with it, though, but some Sundays we are just going to have some lawn chairs up here. We're going to lower it and have a fire down here. Not a real fire, but uh, a make-believe fire. And we're going to tell some stories. And you're going to hear some stories from the people in your congregation about how their life has been changed because of this story. The greatest story there ever was, the Word of God. But folks, if, if this is the only story we've got, and we don't have your stories, people's going to say, well, that was a great book. A lot of great stuff happened a long, long time ago. But it must have no power today. Do you see the importance of us keep telling our stories? Uh, how many went to a, a, a basically an old country church growing up? How many, on, on, they didn't do it too much on Sunday morning, but on Sunday night they had testimony sto service. Raise your hand. All right, what did we do then? Somebody would get up and they'd say, you know, God did this, God done that, God, and the crowd would clap, and, you know, maybe they would shout, maybe they'd run around. I mean, if it, as a kid, uh, uh, we dodge, uh, you know, bobby pins, if you know what bobby pins, because I went to a, 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 a shouting church, and, uh, but they told stories, and whether I understood everything going on or not, it made me believe in this story because this story was still having an effect in their story. What's going to happen to our kids and our grandkids if they never hear that this story is changing this story? What's going to happen? What's going to happen to your children and your children's children if they never get it that this story 
is changing this story. And see, all of our lives, our story is to bring glory to him. Well, a lot of times you say, well, I don't have anything to share. You know, God hadn't done some great, wonderful thing in my life. I'm going to share, I think it's next week, I'm going to be sharing out of the book of Hebrews 11. And the first part of the book of Hebrews 11 tells about people, it seemed like everything they prayed, they got an answer just like that. And God said, you know, glory be to God. God answers prayer. That is amazing. But the latter part of the book of Hebrews, they were people, they didn't get their answer to prayer. Yet they never wavered. They never doubted God. And that became their story. And their story still brought glory to him. Wouldn't it be something if our children and our children's children could hear the story about my mom, my dad, my grandparents, or somebody went through this ordeal in life. It wasn't particularly easy, but they never gave up the faith. I think about Paul. Paul prayed three times that God would move the thorn in the flesh, and he didn't do it. But he said, I'm going to give you grace. So you've got a story about his glory, and it's either this. Because of God's grace and his mercy, he done this wonderful thing for you, or he didn't, but he give you the grace to get through it anyway. Amen. So one way or another, our, our life is a story in him. I want to tell you a very neat story today. And... Uh, it's getting warm up here, so I'm on. <laughs> Your story is glory. Now, I remember I got zapped yesterday with a zapper, so I'm, I'm getting my memory back now. Uh, his story, your story, his glory. I want us to look at this verse of Scripture right here. It says, uh, this is talking about the boy that was born blind. And they're always trying to establish this whole thing right here. But I, I think it's pretty neat. As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. Talking about Jesus went along. He, he was blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Isn't it just like religion to always try to, you know, everything's just black and white. It's never gray. Okay, he's born blind. That must have been, uh, you know, that, that's got to be that the, the boy... We, we assume that the parents sin because, you know, God wouldn't put that on a little baby. And uh, it must be God. We're kind of that way in our society today. Anything bad happens, oh, it's God, all right. It's an act of God. Anything good happens, oh, that must have been you. Well, what about the glory of God, his glory? I got a feeling... Uh, when an author is writing a story, they get to write it like they want to write it. Uh, I got to be on one episode of that show called Nashville, which is going off the air by the way, that somebody picks it up. I was hoping to be on at least two episodes. but uh, And being around that, you get to notice that they begin to pick, okay, this person's going to be this, this he's going to be this person. Everything's going to go right for this person. This person, you, you're going to want things to go right, but something's going to go wrong. But when, when they get through telling the story, all the different characters bring something to the story. Me and my wife was listening to a book on... Uh, audio book, and it was talking about how the, the painstaking ways that they put together the movie Frozen and how many times they rewrote that script. And they wanted, they wanted you know, the, normally there's the villain, and then there was the, there's the uh, Anna, you know, I don't even know all the ones, but you've got the, the good little girl, and then her sister, they were going to make her like the villain, and then they go, well, you know, sisters, they may have problems, but they get back together. And they were telling about the story and how many times they re rewrote that story, Frozen. And they go, well, you know, really what life is about is sometimes sisters don't get along, but sometimes, some way or another, as they get older, they learn to forgive. And they were saying, well, we need to write a story about that then. And, 
And this girl said, well, I've got this thing in my mind. I'm thinking about like, let it go. There's some things in life you just need to let it go. Let it, and they come up with that song, let it go. How many has ever heard the song, let it go, you know? <laughs> but he come up with a great story. But the story ended up being about forgiveness. But the writer had it within their power to write that story any way they wanted to write it. Well, see, what we got to understand God's going to get glory out of our lives one way or another. Even when we mess up and do something stupid like zap ourselves, God can still get glory out of it. Roger did it too, so I'm not the only one. (laughs) But there's not only one way to get glory from God. So... They were having this discussion about who sinned, the parents or the son. Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus. So when something's wrong in our life, it doesn't necessarily mean that we did something wrong. It doesn't necessarily mean our parents did something wrong. It just is. Jesus said, but this happened so the work of God might be displayed in his life. You ever thought about a struggle in your life that you're going through? You don't understand why you're going through it. Nobody else around you understands what's going on. They always assume it's something you did wrong. But what if, what if it's that God might be displayed in his life? What if, what if God is trying to display something glorious in the story of your life. And the way he's going to do it as the writer of the eternal stories of all of our lives, the way that he does it, he's going to get greater glory by writing in your struggle. What if your struggle turns into one of God's greatest stories of glory? Thomas has got a pretty good story in the Bible. Well, I didn't believe he was really uh, rose from the dead, but he told me to touch his hands uh, and put my hands right in the hole there in his side. And after I did it, I believe. But then Jesus said, more blessed are those that don't get to touch me and don't get to see me personally, but yet believe. Similar to the last part of the book of Hebrews. More blessed are those that don't get all their prayers instantly answered, and yet they so trust in the sovereignty of God that they still trust God anyway. What is God saying about you? Some people say, well, you know, the fact that God's letting you go through this struggle is the fact that God, he has great faith in you. Like Job, you know, Job went through a lot of stuff, and and the devil goes, yo, the reason Job serves you so faithfully and he's just all up in your, in, in, in you, in the God thing is because you give him everything. He's got land and houses and belongings and look at how blessed he is. And, and you know, Satan says, I tell you what, if you take all this away from, from Job, he won't serve you anymore. And God said, well, you're on, Satan. Kind of like that fiddler goes down to Georgia, you know. He said, you're on. And so in this story, you start hearing about Job going through one thing after another, after another, after another. And even his family says, well, surely you've disobeyed God. Bad things don't happen to good people unless you've done something wrong. Surely you've done something wrong. And and you are to just curse God and deny him. And Job said, no. Though he slay me, yet... I'll trust him. Is that going to be your story? Is your story going to be the fact that you're going to stand for God no matter what? You're going to stand for God no matter which way the economy turns. You're going to stand for God no matter which way your health turns. You're going to, you're going to, you're going to trust God through blessings or cursings. You're going to constantly trust God. I think about another story in Genesis 15. We have the story of Joseph. Joseph was this young man. He had this this vision of, 
his family bowing down to him and all the, and the bad part about him, he, he, he told about this glorious story that he had received and his brothers didn't take it with the same excitement he did. And they took Joseph out and they were going to throw him in a hole and then they were going to uh, kill him and they were going to take his garments and put blood on it and tell his daddy got eaten by, you know, an animal. But about that time, this, this group of people come through that was headed to Egypt, and they, they just sold Joseph to him, and he went on. And this story of Joseph is a very amazing story because here is Joseph, God's already telling part of the story that Joseph is going to be this one day, but now the story's turning very strongly a different way. Joseph is having a lot of trouble in his life and now he's down and he goes down to Egypt and he gets down there and he starts, you know, coming up through the ranks. He becomes like the, uh, gets to live in the palace there and do things around the palace there. And yet we find that uh, he's falsely accused and he's thrown throw in jail. And after being thrown in jail, he has the understanding of these dreams and he shares that and they bring him from jail he gets to be the right you know in a very high position so his story starts and it goes up and down up and down he's going through valleys and mountains and valleys and mountains but eventually in the story that end goal that God had for him his life brought glory to God his life brought glory to God. Maybe not in the way that Joseph wanted it to be the entire time, but it brought glory to God. That's the main thing. That our life must bring glory to It's not our glory. It's his glory. Our story is his glory. He'll write it however he wants to write it. He'll write it however he writes it to get the most glory. Because it's his story. It's not our story. Ultimately, when it's all said and done, it's his story. We belong to God. And uh, you see that over and over and over in Scripture. You see it over and over and over again. And here we find it in this thing. Uh, so it is with this man born blind. Same thing. He, uh, one thing I want you to notice about your story is your story, it's in your outline there, your story is unique. There's nobody else got your story. And, and so this guy right here, he's got a unique story. As long as it is day, we must do the work of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. He goes on then. You intended, uh, is what Joseph said in the end of his story. He said, you intended to harm me, but God intended for it to be good. To accomplish what is now being done and saving many lives. Joseph realized that all that he went through was for a higher reason. It was for a better story. It was for God's glory. And we're going to see that in this young man's life too. And so your story is unique. Joseph's story was unique. This man that was born blind, his story was unique. I've told you my story before. When I was born, I was born with a speech impediment, and I couldn't speak plain at all. I failed first grade. In fourth grade, though, my parents took me to an old tent revival in Florida, and a minister prayed for me. He prayed for me very unusual, and, and you know, he asked my parents, can I pray for him the way that I feel led of God to pray for him? And my parents said, yeah. So he took and he touched his finger to his tongue and then touched it to my tongue, which is not very sanitary if you want to speak of it. It's probably as sanitary as a bug zapper. But, <laughs> but here's the thing. When he got through, I was healed. I was completely healed. I was at, they took me out of the speech class. God done it. So that's my story. And he touched me and he said, God's going to use you to share his word. And so as I got older, yeah, I went through some teenage years, but eventually I 
ended up exactly like the man said. I believe he was a man of God, but that's my story. My story's different. Uh, I have yet to touch my finger in my mouth and touch any of you. <laughs> Don't put it past me, though. <laughs> uh, this unique story, though, having said this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with saliva, and put it on the man's eyes, and said, go, go, he told him, wash in the pool of Shalom. The word means sent. So the man went and he washed and he came home seeing. Now, I don't know about sometimes we get in the middle of the story. Can you imagine this blind guy? He, he's blind and then this guy spits in some mud and makes a little mud ball and sticks it in the guy's eye. Now he's really blind. He's walking. Now he's walking with mud and they're probably asking him on the way to the pool, who put the mud in your eyes? That's horrible. What kind of horrible guy just took a blind guy? It's like you're taking and you're, you're picking on a blind guy. But see, the people that would say that, they didn't know who put that mud in his eye. It was the Messiah. It was God. This become his unique story. I was kind of doing some background study on this story this week, and I found out, See, Jesus knew what was acceptable among the Pharisees and what was not acceptable among the Pharisees. I don't know if you know it or not, but in the Old Testament, uh, there is reference, historical references to the fact that they said a prophet, a prophet while they were fasting, if a prophet was fasting and someone come to be prayed for, that the very saliva of a prophet that is fasting had healing virtues in it. I don't know if Jesus was trying to reach back in the story and it would be one more solidification that he was indeed a prophet or not. But that is, that is something that I found out in, in studying this passage that, uh, you know, they, they had, this had been done before. This had been done before. And so... Uh, it, it becomes this guy's story. But anyway, Jesus makes a little mud ball and he puts it in the guy's eye. He goes and washes at the pool and he comes out seeing. So uh, here's the thing that we need to realize too. That's, we all got a beginning story, but your story is not complete. Some people's got a story like they want to serve God for a while and then they want to take off for a couple of years and, you know, our story's not complete. You go, when I get my kids raised, I'm just going to do as I well. please. I'll come to church if I want to. Well, what about being a decent grandparent? What about being a decent great-grandparent? What, what about still showing your children and your children's children that it's important to serve God, that you don't outgrow the story of God? It don't, it, there's not a point in time it's over. Your story's not complete. So sometimes people come and they see our story, and our story, you know, when the blind man was walking around with mud in his eye, that wasn't a very good story. But when he washed out the mud and he could see, and, and you know, some of you, you're at a point in your life right now, your story is not a very happy story. But you've got to remember, your story's not over yet. Missionary one time went and spent about 20 years on the mission field, and he come home. And a president had just went and spent a week in Africa, and uh, he had come back, and he had been hunting, and they had a ticker tape parade for him. And the missionary said, you know, I spent 20 years on the mission field, and they do nothing for me. And this president had been hunting for a week, and they do a big parade for him. Man, that's no way to welcome somebody home. And somebody put their arm around the missionary and said, but you're not home yet. Folks, we're not home yet. Our, our end of our story is when this life is over. Our story's not over yet. God's still working on our story. We may be in the valley of our story, but there's still more story to tell. Stay faithful to God. Keep believing in God's sovereignty. Believe that God's writing this story. And whether your story takes a nosedive or not, God can make all things come out for, for our good. We don't see it. We don't understand it now because our story's not complete. We're not done yet. So here's what happened in this young man's story. His neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, 
Isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? And some claim that he was. Others said, no, he only looks like him. But he himself insisted, I am the man. I am the man. I'm the one that was mine. Indeed, I was. And, and so he, he tells his story. Only thing he knows about healing is that he is the man they call Jesus. They ask him, who healed you? He said, all I know, his name is called Jesus. He doesn't even know where Jesus is. At this point in the story, he knows something extraordinary has happened to him, but he's not aware of the results of the event. Even when he, we get to the end of the story, we don't know the whole story. How does the man's faith work out in his life? We don't know that. Where, where does he end up going? What does he, uh, how many people in his life does he impact with his story over a lifetime? His story was destined to go on and on and on. And we're still telling his story today. So that man's story is still being told today. Thousands of years later... That's the way our personal stories should be going. That's why I tell people it's good to keep a, a spiritual jur journal and let your kids and your kids know that God worked in your life, that God done something in your life. You know, uh, Dr. Bright, Bill Bright, he was over this uh, Promise Keepers uh, Campus Crusade for Christ, but he was at the Promise Keepers meeting. This was back in 2012. He had to stand before a Promise Keepers meeting which was a, a men's meeting, a, a stadium full of men, and he had to tell them about he had lung cancer, a lung disease. And, you know, here is this man that just kind of took their breath away that this great man of God has got lung cancer now, and, you know, they don't know what will happen. But... As he was announcing his condition to the secular media one time, he was asked if he had any regrets. And Dr. Bright said he was, he, here's what Dr. Bright said. He said, I'm in a win-win situation, folks. If I live, I'd be able to go on doing ministry, he said. If I die, I'll be glorifying God face to face. Either way, he said, it's a win-win situation. Those are the words of someone who understands his story is not complete. By the way, we're telling his story here today about a man in the face of death still believed in a sovereign God, that God's still in control. Those are the words of someone we understand that until the last moment of his earthly life, God is working out a wonderful story in his life. Go a little bit further here. They brought to the Pharisees this man who had been blind. Now the day on which Jesus had made the mud and opened the man's eyes was the Sabbath. That's a problem for the Pharisees. You don't do nothing on the Sabbath. Therefore the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. He said, well, he put mud in my eyes. And the man replied, and I washed it, and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God for he does not keep the Sabbath. Isn't it amazing when religion gets in the way of a miracle? He don't keep the Sabbath. He can't be from God. The Pharisees were trying to find every way they possibly can to disprove that Jesus was truly God. I want you to see something. Here was a blind man in the process of gaining not only uh, physical light physical sight he was also getting spiritual understanding and sight his understanding was growing and the pharisees because they were rejecting the truth they were becoming blinded to the truth if you constantly embrace the truth whether it's going good for you or bad for you, you constantly embrace truth god will keep giving you truth god will keep expanding his truth god will keep enlightening you but my friend, you start denying the truth. Sometimes we don't like the truth because it tells us we need to change some things. We need to grow up. But if you start denying the, cru the truth, you'll start becoming blinded by that truth. You'll become blinded by it. 
And so they were, they were, they were blinded here. They're growing, they're growing worse and worse off. This, they said, this man is not from God or he wouldn't have done this on the Sabbath. Finally, they turned again to the blind man. What have you to say about him? But he asked, how can a sinner do such mir miraculous signs? Here's what he said. How, if, if you're calling him a sinner, how does a sinner do these miraculous things? These miraculous things. How can a sinner do this? So they were divided. Finally, they turned again to the blind man. What have you to say about him? It was your eyes he opened. The man replied, he's a prophet. Now, I want you to see where this guy's understanding is growing as he's defending what Jesus done in his life. At first, he said, I don't even know who he is. He, they call him Jesus. Well, where is he at? I don't know. Where did he come from? I don't know. But, that, but now the more they question him, it's starting to ring a bell in him. Okay, okay, I know I was blind, and I know now I can see. I know the Pharisees don't like it because he healed me on the Sabbath, and they're calling him a sinner. But if he's a sinner, how does a sinner do miracles? And I'm a miracle. So well, what, do you, what, do you, what do you believe about this man? You had to be very careful because they were throw you out of the temple. And he goes, well, I tell you what, he's a prophet. He went from not even knowing who Jesus was to now Jesus is a prophet. That's the blind man saying that. Jesus is a prophet. So his understanding is growing. The Jews still did not believe. See, they're getting further and further from God because of their disbelief. They didn't, still did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they sent for the man's parents. So the parents for, were pretty wise too because the parents say one wrong thing. They were going to throw him out of the temple. So they bring the parents in. Is this your son, they ask. Yes, he's. Is this the one you say was born blind? How is it that now he can see? They said, we know he is our son. <laughs> we know he's our son. We're not faking this. We know he's our son, the parents answered. And we know he was born blind. That's no doubt about that. But how he can see now or who opened his eyes, we don't know. Do you see how this, this young boy that was born blind is is being a, a major message here to the Jews. And so the parents were wise. The parents wasn't going to get in this argument. The parents says, ask him. He's of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews, for already the Jews had decided that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was the Christ would be put out of the synagogue. You know, when you stop believing, you put up that wall. Some of you have had some hard things happen in your life, and you don't really realize, but you put up a wall between you and God. And ever since that wall's been put up in your life, you've not let God in anymore. And basically, the bottom line about your life, you don't believe in God anymore. You don't believe God is real anymore. You, you're not giving Him really first place in your life. You're falling from a distance. But they said, ask him. Ask him. And so here's the next thing I want you to see in this, finishing up this sermon today. You will grow spiritually as you tell your story. That's why it's so, so important for you to keep telling your story. Tell your story. Sometimes you have to get to a point in your story. I don't really know what God's doing in my life right now, but God is God and he's in charge. Maybe that's your story right now because your story's not complete. Your story don't have to have a happy ending right now for it to be a story where God gets the glory. I can't imagine if you're a child of God and you're born again, you're a child of God, you've got a story. And I'm telling you, God's already working a story in some of you that don't know God today. God's been working a story. This blind man, when he was born, God was already working a story in him. Some of your greatest struggles in life is going to become your greatest story, and it's going to be for God's glory. Back in the 60s and 70s when a lot of drug activity was going on, uh, it seemed like everybody got up in church, they were telling about how God delivered them from drugs. 
Well, you know, as I grew up, I, I wasn't in drugs yet. I, I was, you know, working my way there, but I wasn't there yet. And uh, it's almost like, well, I need to become a drug addict where I'll have a good testimony. <laughs> you almost feel like you've got to be a drug addict to have a good testimony, you know. But there's more testimonies than just that. There's, there's all kind of testimonies. Because of our culture and time, that was an important testimony, but there's other testimonies than that. You'll grow as you tell your story. For we are God's workmanship, the Bible says, created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. We are God's story. I want you to see this. The first time they asked this young man who Jesus was, he said, I, I don't know, his name was Jesus, but he'd done this and this and this, and he healed me. The second time they summoned the man who had been blind, give glory to God, they said, we know this man is a sinner. Now that's what the Jews said, you need to give glory to God since they couldn't deny the fact that he was healed, but you need to give glory to God. Don't give no glory to that man because he's a sinner. But here's what the blind guy said. Whether he is a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I know, I was blind, now I see. And they asked him, what did he do to you? And they told him that. And then the man answered, well, now that is remarkable. You don't know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. You don't, you don't even know him. You don't know where he comes from, and he opened my eyes. And yet know that God does not listen to sinners. That, that now this blind guy is preaching them a message. You're saying you don't know him. You don't know where he comes from. I'm telling you that he's God. I'm telling you that he opened my eyes. And you know that God does not listen to sinners. So you can't say Jesus is even a sinner because God don't listen to sinners. He listens to the godly man who does his will. Nobody has ever heard of an opening of the man's born uh, of a man's born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. To this they replied, man, he got this blind man's got him up against the corner. You were steeped in sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? The Jews are so defending the fact that they don't want to acknowledge that Jesus is the son of the living God. They're doing that today in the real world. They're still, they'll embrace every kind of religion out there but Christianity. Because they don't want to admit that Jesus Christ is truly the son of God. And you know what Jesus needs right now? We don't need no more Bibles. We got the greatest Bible there ever was. What we do need though is more stories. We need more stories of people like you and I that is declaring that God is still working in our lives today. I pray that you will think about giving your story. Whether you come up here and sit in a lawn chair with us and tell your story around the fire, or whether you write it out and let somebody else read it, I challenge you to, to tell your story during this series. They said, we dare you lecture us and they threw him out. I want you to notice the, the opposition. First time he simply questioned by the Pharisees. Then his parents are subject to grilling. Finally, he's brought before the Pharisees for confrontational meeting where he is ultimately insulted and thrown out. The basic principle is that the more we understand the nature of our relationship with Jesus Christ and the more we try to articulate that relationship through our words and our deeds, the more opposition we might encounter. As you tell the exciting story of what Jesus is doing in your life, some people will not take it well. That's true. Your story is unique. You'll understand it later on. Your story is not even complete yet. You will encounter some opposition as you tell your story. But you will grow. You will grow spiritually. Here's the thing. Michael Card wrote a, a poem, and I'm going to close with this today. Life is a song that we sing with our days, a poem with meaning more than words can say, a painting with colors no rainbow can tell, a lyric that rhymes either heaven or hell. We're living letters that doubt decrate, 
doubt desecrates were the notes of the song of the chorus of faith. God shapes every second of our little lives and minds every minute as the universe waits by. What's your story today? What is your story that God is painting through you today? What is it that God wants you to tell? What is it that God has done in your life? I pray that you will tell your story. That you will tell your story. I tell you, as a little boy, I, I was like that little boy. I, I didn't know if this tent revival guy was real or not. I see people go up. I didn't ask my parents if I could go up. I went up. He was sitting in a little chair and they had a little bridge. And he sat there in his chair. And we had to come up over the bridge where he, because he prayed for people for hours. And he prayed for me that day when I was healed. That's my story and I'm sticking to it. Because I, I, I really, do, is it, it doesn't matter to me that, whether you believe my story or not. I'm just telling you it's my story and it happened in my life. Something very personal that I'm not trying to defend this because I don't even know if I'm qualified to defend all the stuff in this. I, I'll tell you the best way I understand it, but I can defend this. Because I know the way I used to speak, and I know the way I speak now, and I know that God is a healer. I don't have any doubt about that. You, you may be, be able to make me doubt a lot of things, but that's one thing you cannot make me doubt, because it happened to me. It happened to me in my life. And a lot of you, you know there's certain things, you, there's not a lot of things you're that certain on, but there's certain things in your life you know that certain that God done something in your life. You remember a time that you were not like this, and, and, and now you are, and, and God has done something. How many would raise your hand and say, there's some things in my life that I know without any doubt that God done in my life? Will you raise your hand? Look around you at these hands. You know, the sad thing is, I don't know all of your stories. I wish I did. And I, I wish that even if we were just sitting around a make-believe fire and we passed the mic around that you would tell your story. I believe that when we left the service that day, it would not be a service in vain. Because people would go, that God that died on the cross, that God that went back to heaven, that God is still working. That's why in the book of Acts it said he's writing about what Jesus began both to do and to teach. He's not through yet he it's what he began and the book of acts is more stuff he's doing and more stuff he's doing and then as these other guys they begin to write and they were called the epistles a living epistles that's what you are you're living writings of jesus's story and god's story is still being told today i want us to bow our heads at this time and go to the lord in prayer Today on this Memorial Day weekend, we have some people, and I was in college, and uh, I had to write a paper, and I was trying to come across a theme in English to write about. And I had a friend that when I lived in Fort Myers, he had got uh, saved under our ministry there. And he told me this story about A time in war that they went in and they took over this town and they had to take and they put the flag up. And that was the last thing they were going to do there. And it was still a lot of miscellaneous fire going on. And he said, well, I'll do it. I'll, I'll go. I'll be the one that goes and sets the flag. And they go, well, you're going to do it right now? He said, no, I'm going to do it in the morning at 9 o'clock. And they said, why 9 o'clock? He said, in the morning at 9 o'clock, my mama will be down on her knees praying for me. And if I'm going to risk my life, I'm going to do it while my mom's down on her knees praying. So he scheduled the time where it would be the same time that his mom was, whatever time it would be, the 9 o'clock in America. And he went and he put that flag up and he was, life was spared. I don't know about you, that's a powerful testimony to me. That's a powerful story. That man in the middle of war, when the battle's raging, 
he realized that if I'm going in, I'm going in with cover. And the cover I need is my mama's prayers. You've got a story. You've got a story that somebody needs to hear. Your family may need to hear. God is still working today in the church. We need to never forget that God's still a healer and God's still a, a revealer and God's still opening our eyes and God's still helping us to understand. So I'm going to pray today and I'm going to pray that that would happen in your life today and you would get brave enough to tell your story. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you today. We thank you today for this congregation. Lord, the hands went up of so many stories out here. So many people could raise their hand today in this service saying that they had a time in their life that it's undoubtedly a fact that God done something in their life. And God, we thank you for still being alive and well, fully alive in your church today. And I thank you, Lord, for this congregation. And I pray today, if there be one here today that hadn't fully embraced you as Lord and Savior, that today they would be a believer. Today they would accept Jesus Christ. Today that they would let Jesus Christ in. I ask it in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm going to stand here if you, any of you need prayer today. I'd love to pray with you about anything you're going through. And closing today. Let's stand. They're going to play one more round of this song. If you like prayer, please come very quickly.